Hey guys, and welcome to episode 170 of the OCDStories.com podcast. Now in this episode, I interview Dr. Jonathan Hoffman. John is a licensed psychologist at the Neurobehavioral Institute in Florida. And I got him on to talk about many things, uh, particularly OCD and its mechanisms, so the workings behind OCD, uh, and uh, comorbidity. So that's just additional kind of disorders that someone may have alongside OCD, such as depression or PTSD. Um, So first of all, we get John's therapy story, which is really interesting to hear kind of why he got into OCD treatment and his experience over the years and the work he does now. Then we go into uh, OCD and its mechanisms. Uh, He explains kind of the inner workings of OCD, ways of viewing OCD, which I I found interesting, uh, and much, much more on that topic. And then we go into comorbidities. So I asked him, what does the world need to know about comorbidities and OCD? Comorbidities is not something I've really talked about a lot on the podcast. So it was great to get his take as an expert on the subject on it. We talk about autism spectrum disorder alongside OCD and also working with comorbidities. And then the usual questions towards the end. It was a wide-ranging conversation. Uh, I really enjoyed it, and hopefully you will too. And uh, if you get time, please leave a review uh, wherever you listen to this podcast because it helps me reach more people and lets me know about the work I'm doing. So without further ado, here is John. On the podcast today, I have Dr. Jonathan Hoffman. John is a licensed psychologist in the states of Florida, New York, and Utah. He is a clinical director of the Neurobehavioral Institute, which he co-founded with Dr. Katia Moritz. Welcome to the podcast, John. Thank you. Happy to be here with you. Uh, it's good to have you here. And, and uh, that was a very shortened version of your CV. I was going through it the other day, and uh, I think I could have written a whole page on it. So uh, hopefully that did you justice. Um, Absolutely. Thank you. So uh, I always get people to either share their kind of OCD story if they have one. If not with clinicians, I always like to get the kind of why they started with their therapy story, but kind of more importantly, focusing on the OCD bits of that story. Well, my, my OCD story kind of parallels the story of OCD because, you know, one of the things that um, we've found over the years is that OCD has a very heterode- heterogeneous profile and uh, and etiology, meaning it's very different for different people, and it starts in all sorts of different ways. So I think with, in, with knowing so many specialists in OCD, we have very you know heterogeneous stories. Some people start treating OCD because they have it themselves or someone in their family. It's very, very personal for them. Some um, were just in a particular place at a particular time, and it was a little random, like OCD itself, and it became kind of like compelling, like OCD. Yeah. And I think that's my story a bit. I was... Um, I happen to uh, be friends with the sister of an internationally famous OCD expert who star- and I was working at a hospital shortly after I graduated and they knew me, the, the uh, uh, person, Dr. Fugen Nesirolo, she, she knew me and um, when they started admitting patients to the hospital where I was working, they asked me if I wanted to be involved with treating uh, people with OCD and I didn't know all that much about it, I knew somewhat, and, but from the moment I started working with people and I saw the effectiveness of exposure and response prevention and the in- the just the sheer um, impact of OCD and the interesting nature of treating it because it's so it, it has so many nuances and you can just never know enough about it. That's why most of uh, we people who treat OCD become kind of obsessive about it, um, that I just became um, kind of enamored of, of the whole field. And I eventually started working at their uh, the clinic of uh, Dr. Nesirolo and her, her uh, partner, Dr. Jose Ura Tobias. And um, I worked there for many years. And before I came down to Florida and uh, um, started working with uh, Dr. Moritz for NBI. But it's very reinforcing that from the moment I started working with OCD, and that's how OCD started too. It just became something that I became more and more in, intrigued with. And much like I think uh, we're going to speak, be speaking about comorbidities today, I've also picked up comorbidities as I've gone along, as many people with OCD do. And I just became interested in just not the um, core of OCD, but all of the different uh, conditions that go along with it, which are uh, um, amazingly varied. Hmm. I don't know if that was uh, an answer that got to the heart of that question, but that's how I think of it. My story, story my OCD story is kind of like random plus reinforcement, yeah. but I must have had some <laughs> inherent uh, X factor there that was triggered by, by treating, by treating uh, yeah. people with OCD. No, thank you for sharing. It's, it's fascinating. And uh, I, love, I love asking therapists that question. 
Uh, and there's always common threads of how they kind of fell mm. into treating OCD. And often it's, they just, as soon as they saw the effectiveness of the treatment, they just kind of fell in love and the, the, they just seem to like the, the clients or the patients. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and like when I had, uh, Katia Maritz on Dr. Katia Maritz, she talked about how in Brazil, she, she got lucky that the only CBT therapist was her mentor. And then mm-hmm. she came to New York, I believe. Um, yeah okay cool no yes. thank sorry go on you yeah, please yeah. Oh, okay cool thank you so um mentioning katya uh she went when she put me in contact with you uh she mentioned two things one was she said you're a genius on comorbidity <laughs> her words yeah. uh, we'll uh, see i guess <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a little much but yeah. <laughs> that's nice of her to say yeah so we'll come on to that in a bit um mm-hmm. and then she also said you know you know ocd and its mechanics its mechanisms kind of arguably better than anyone so um it'd be good just to unpack unpack that so a question i wrote was uh, if you had to explain ocd to someone so they really understand the sort of the inner workings of it how would you describe that well i think the core of ocd actually is that for whatever reason and we could say it's genetic or it is biology there's all different reasons mm-hmm. people have this kind of sensitivity to things going a certain way or not feeling a certain way and i think basically as ocd starts to um, snowball in people's lives, their whole system develops an expectancy. So for example, if you have a a germ phobia and you see something that you think might be germy in some respect, or um, you're not sure about it, you have a doubt about it, you're gonna try to avoid it, not touch it or get around it in some way, and your whole system develops an expectancy that that's what you're going to do. And it's reinforcing when you you give into that expectancy because you, you feel better because you've avoided it and that tends to kind of grow the condition. To the contrary, when you do OCD um, treatment, you're violating that expectancy. So through exposure, you're touching what you would have uh, previously avoided, and that puts pressure on your whole system to change. I think of it kind of like, well, working out with weights or something like that, that, that your body changes because you put pressure on it to change, or, you, or your intellect changes because you do hard things. Lots of things in life are like that because you violate the expectancy. I didn't used to you know, do the hard, course in math, but now I do it. And your whole system adjusts, hopefully, so that you can understand it. I think, I think OCD works like a lot of our systems work in terms of change, that you violate the expectancy, you stay in that situation long enough, and what used to elicit avoidance now elicits a, a exposure and doing it. And that creates kind of a, a, a virtuous uh, circle where that just beca- that tends to grow. Whereas if you keep going with the expectation, you have a vicious circle and it gets worse and worse and that is one of the reasons why ocd is progressive for so many people yeah good point like yeah i always kind of look at it as kind of two spirals one going up Mm -hmm. one going down right similar to depression i guess and we don't want to say well every step you take and every move you make so to speak uh takes you closer or further from ocd but it's kind of true yeah that that's how these systems work through you know like kind of like uh, the slow death of a thousand cuts sometimes mm. that you none is so big so you didn't touch this or you didn't or you check this one time but it all kind of adds up and when you start to fight it through exposures uh, or medicines help you with it you're kind of doing something different and every little bit of that counts as well yeah that's that's a really good point and kind of what what hit me as you were talking is you know, people talk about relapse and, and sometimes I'm sure maybe it is a biological change and it just kind of hits them like a tidal wave. But sometimes part of me feels that it's it's the people... And, and when I talk to people, they, they kind of say that, that they stop doing the things they learn in therapy. And mm-hmm. maybe what they're then doing is those little rituals, those little compulsions, those, I think Abramowitz calls them like micro compulsions or something. Um, you wouldn't even notice that they're a, a compulsion, but over time, it's almost like a slippery slope. Is that kind of? A, yes, a, it's it, yeah. It's kind of like it, like you've been on a diet for a while, and then you say, "All right, I'm doing well, looking good, I'm thin." All right, but what could one piece of pie hurt or a couple of bites? Well, it, it's true. Um, we have a, pre, a bias toward the present, present bias that we would say, "Well, in, in that moment, that's not such a big deal." We're just thinking about that moment. But you add up all those pieces of cake and, and pasta and whatever else that you try, have been um, avoiding so that you could stay in, uh, 
at, at a different uh, weight if that's what your interest is in doing. You know, all of those little things do add up. And one day you look at the scale and you've gained back the weight that you've lost. It's very hard because in order to do better in anything, we have to go beyond the present. We have to think of, all right, where does all these little steps, where do all these little decisions lead? And that's not human nature to do that. We have to, you know, really impose that on ourselves or, or help our, our patients do that in order to make lasting changes and stick to it. And in a funny way, it's kind of like braces too. You know, braces change the shape of your teeth. They kind of are annoying and costly, just like I guess the uh, ERP could be in some cases. But, you know, the truth is your teeth aren't going to stay that way unless you use your retainer. And, you know, after a while, if your teeth are straight, you say, oh, I don't need this every night or something. But yeah. again, it's just as you said, it's a slippery slope. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for explaining that. Um, okay, so next question then around that is, does having kind of a firm grasp on kind of, for example, how my brain works with OCD, does, to, to truly understanding that as a person with OCD, does that help kind of recovery? Does that help kind of in noticing when you're maybe, well, does it help, I guess, spot that vicious cycle or anything else? Yes and no. Sometimes people get, uh, they, they get so um, micro about how their brain works. They want to know, is it this neurotransmitter and is it this um, uh, circuitry or this structure and what's going on in MRI? That level of knowledge is interesting for research, but not at all any more interesting than to somebody. I'll go back to my analogy of lifting weights. You don't have to know which exact, you know, of your many, many um, um, muscle fibers, which one is being activated by lifting weight. It's a holistic process. So knowing about how people make behavioral and, uh, and um, neurological changes in general, how we can um, ignite neuroplasticity, so to speak, mm. through exposures, through um, response preventions, that's important to understand that that's how your whole system works, as opposed to get into the minutia of exactly how your brain works. Yeah. Okay. No, thank you. That's, that's useful. Um, and, and something I've seen as well, uh, through emails and uh, kind of in social media, uh, almost like pe people expect kind of an, an instant result with, say, exposure therapy. And sometimes you, you can, you know, within a week start to do an exposure and be like, oh, wow, it kind of temporarily kind of goes this one part. But um, I guess the, the goal of ERP is kind of over time, you're, you're remolding your brain kind of. Right. You could no, realistically, you could no more make those kind of subtle um, changes in neuroplasticity and in the uh, structure of OCD by doing it a few, ERP a few times. And some people say, oh, I'm really better. But that's like having, uh, like almost having an illusion. You went to a gym twice and wow, why, you know, you'd say, wow, I look really great. I don't need to go anymore. Or, you know, how come it's not working for me? Now, these, yeah. these are things which really, and I think it's one of the hardest things to communicate, that OCD is a chronic condition. It probably, just like teeth will move back or you'll gain back the weight or you'll be out of shape if you don't keep going to the gym, that really the best treatment is lifelong. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean informal treatment, but lifelong um, sticking with the behavioral changes that you start in treatment. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, okay, cool. So I thought I'd ask you this question. It's not something I've ever asked a therapist or clinician, um, but many people kind of talk about OCD uh, being kind of the bully or kind of the unhelpful helper. It's it's in a way trying to help you, but it's kind of in overdrive uh, or the anxious brain. And there are many ways to label it. And obviously various labels help different people kind mm -hmm. of combat it. But I guess from your own experience, what label do you think kind of sums up the OCD experience? You know, is it a bully? Is it kind of this unhelpful well, well, helper? I agree with you that everybody has something that works for them. Thinking about it as kind of something tricking them or a bully can really help with people. But I think our, our field is kind of in treating OCD is kind of moving away from that, uh, that approach that, you know, you have to change your thought or you have to eradicate the bully. Mm. But more importantly, that you just have to see a mental process that, you know, as we always say, a thought is just a thought and really just accept um, the, the content of your of what's going on with you, whether it's a physical sensation or, or, or something, you know, in terms of a, a thought process or, or a, a, an emotion and just kind of accept it and have a distance on it and, you know, kind of be able to live your life despite what's going on with you. So sometimes when you get involved in a, in a war, you forget to live. Hmm. I mean, I think it helped many people for a lot of uh, 
a lot of years use those analogies, but I think as OCD treatment is evolving, you know, as well. And I think now we, we're really focused on trying to accept um, whatever whatever's happening and see these things as kind of almost like uh, automatic processes, but they're not the ones to kind of, um, the, the ones that help you navigate through life. I always tell people about like in the ancient world when, um, when people were navigating, they didn't really have GPS or technology. They had to find a fixed point, which was the North Star. They couldn't get to it, but they could triangulate their position and kind of figure out their course and course correct if they weren't headed toward it. In OCD treatment, we try to make the, the North Star having a really good life. Hmm. And then if you're kind of off track or anything, you know, um, to try to follow what gives you a good life. And one of the things about navigation is you can't navigate, apparently. I'm, I'm not a sailor. I don't know, but I understand that you can't navigate by anything that isn't fixed. That's not a fixed point. So navigating by your thoughts, your feelings, your sensations, your situations really can run you aground, so to speak. Mm. You know, and that's what happened with people with OCD, that they start navigating by things like, like knowing for sure or exact cleanliness or do I want this or not or whatever, whatever it is or exact or, or something in, in their uh, appearance that nobody else might even notice. They start navigating by things that, are, that account for almost nothing in terms of the 100% of having a good life, that they're focused on the point zero, 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 whatever, one of life. And that becomes the navigational tool. But that's usually um, inherently not going to work. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, and I love that metaphor. Um, yeah, it kind of reminds me of values of also knowing your values and using those mm -hmm. over your emotions. And yeah. yeah, yeah, those would be your North Stars. And that's kind of like how acceptance and commitment therapy really has contextualized OCD treatment. You're still doing the same exposures, and, and but the reasons you're doing it really are value and goal-based, exa exactly. Yeah. Cool, and then you have, to have, you have to have a reason why you'd want to suffer through all of this, yeah. just like you have to have a really good reason to suffer through braces, I guess, or, yeah. or a hard workout. But, but to, for people with OCD to really understand that to, again, I'll use that same term, to ignite the neuroplastic changes, which are really the active ingredient in OCD treatment, everything else that we do in treatment just supports one's ability to kind of stay in the gym long enough to have a result, stay with the braces enough, stay with the retainer. Everything is supporting these things, mm -hmm. but the active ingredient is that expectancy violation that ignites change yeah. or the medicines that, that, that can do that um, to, in some parallel fashion as well. Yeah. No, thank you. That's really interesting. And I guess on that note, then, let's say you got someone in in the treatment room and it's early on and you, you want to help them figure out that kind of North Star. Are there mm -hmm. any kind of particular conversations or exercises that you go through to, to get them to figure that out? Yes, there are many. But the core one it really always boils down to what would be a great life for you? Mm -hmm. And what would it take for you to have this great life? What would it take for you to be in school or have a relationship or, or make the money you want, or just be the kind of person you want? Mm. And is it worth suffering through that uncertainty, through a fear, through anxiety, through not knowing, whatever your OCD uh, at the core is about, or that you, you might hurt someone, uh, you know, realistically, we hope, um, that, that something, you know, is it worth suffering through all that lack of knowledge to, to have the life you want? And that's the core of it, because mm. we know with OCD treatment that people that the vast majority of people can improve. But having people have the willingness and commitment, as we always say, to to stay in that, that's the hard part. Yeah. Yeah, really, really good point. And do you is that something you re revisit every session or is it kind of as and when you, you feel people are losing that that focus and motivation? I think it's the framework for everything we do. Mm. So that would be kind of either just implicit in the way that we do the exposures it's uh, or it's explicit that we'll talk about it that we're here for a reason yeah you know and and you know the, the truth is if you're not sometimes with erp you can improve if you're not having you know a hot you know super high um you know we call it suds level uh, that kind of distress you might feel that use that helps us monitor and track if the exposures are doing anything I mean, sometimes you have it and sometimes you don't. But there is some truth that if you're not having some experience, you're probably not doing something. You know, you could do exposures. And, and part of the problem is it could look like an exposure, but people with OCD are very adept at subtle avoidances. Mm -hmm. So it could look like they're touching something. They're not really touching the part of their finger, so to speak, 
where it really matters. Yeah. So we try to help people really engage with this as fully as possible. Yeah. Okay, great. No, thank you. That was really, really useful. Um, so, so let's go on to comorbidities. Um, and comorbidities um, is something we've touched on a bit in the podcast, but not as much as I'd like at the minute. We've, we've, we've gone into addiction a bit. Um, but I guess to start off, for those that are kind of confused by this word, what does comorbidity mean? Well, technically, I guess it means the presence of one or more conditions in addition to the primary condition. In this case, we're talking about OCD. But I would extend it and broaden that definition because what does condition really mean? Does condition mean a very close to OCD disorder? We call an OCD-related uh, disorder like uh, trichotillomania, hoarding, uh, body dysmorphic disorder, or skin picking? Or does it mean some of the other uh, um, diagnosable conditions that go along with OCD, um, depression, uh, bipolar disorder, anxi- different kinds of anxiety disorders? Or does it mean things that seem to be kind of similar, like you know, uh, body-focused uh, repetitive behaviors? Or does condition really mean it's your life condition? Hey, you just don't have access to treatment, or you don't have the resources to do it, or the time, or you have a learning disability. You know, to me, it's it, it, the, the whole... Um, that OCD, if OCD is the core that we're talking about today, all of these conditions circulate around OCD, some before it, some after it. Some uh, OCD picks it up like a, like a, I guess like an, an, a rock in an avalanche, picks up different things. Sometimes some fly off it, some come into it. But, but OCD, I think one of the interesting to me about the whole subject of comorbidities is that OCD can combine with just about anything. Hmm. Is there? No, that, that was really useful. Is it? Is, yeah, it can combine with almost anything. Is there any like real ones you never really see two go together? Any two diagnoses? Hmm. That's a really inter- interesting question. Um, I, I'm trying to think of some, something that we really haven't seen with OCD. Look, you can could, you could see eating disorders with OCD. As you said, addiction, substance use disorders. You could see uh, Tourette's and tic disorders. You can see uh, mood disorders. You can see anxiety disorders. You can see developmental disorders like autism spectrum disorder. You can see personality disorders, whether obsessive compulsive personality Mm. or uh, borderline personality or other things like that. Um, You can see medical conditions. You can see medical conditions induced by substances which interplay with OCD. So I'm going to go out on a limb here and say um, no. You, oh, you could you could see yeah. things like with pandas and uh, you know strep infections. Mm. I mean, just just about anything because uh, you know where I was trained, OCD was thought uh, about as a foundational condition, and you know I don't think that's discussed so much. But I've always seen the wisdom of thinking of it that way that it just kind of is part and parcel of so many different things. It can be the stage before schizophrenia. It can be a co- it could be something that kind of is on a parallel process with a thought disorder. You know, a person could be impulsive on one end, like with ADHD or things like that, and they can be completely compulsive on the other end. It just mm. intermixes so much. You can be uh, uh, very sloppy about some things and completely um, neat about one particular thing in your room. Uh, we always say to people that OCD kind of defies logic. Yeah. And I think that's really, uh, that's really a wise thing because it is confusing to people because, well, how could you not care at all about you know, getting uh, uh, an, an illness and do really risky things at the same time, worry about getting this particular illness so much you can't function. But this is all the case. Yeah. And that, to me, is one of the really fascinating aspects of OCD and has kept me engaged with this for uh, more than three decades now at this point. Yeah, you're right. Because I think at first glance, OCD and, and its treatment can seem quite simplistic almost but then when you I mean I remember getting to like episode 20 of this podcast and being like I feel like I've covered everything that needs to be covered (laughs) about OCD and OCD treatment Uh, and now I'm like nearly 170 episodes in and I'm like there's still so much more um so right yeah that's one of the fascinating things about OCD is that the more you learn about it the more you realize there's some things you didn't know uh the other day I had someone um explained to me that their perfectionism about doing OCD treatment was actually one of the reasons they were getting stuck so much by not moving. Because mm-hmm. if, any, if, they, if we were going to say that almost we wanted to fight OCD at all, uh, 
uh, you know, and, and all of its appearances, they started to wonder, well, maybe everything I do is OCD. So maybe I shouldn't do anything. So it just be, can become so convoluted, you yeah. know, in some people's minds and more severe cases that there's something new to understand, there's some nuance of it, that even if you've been doing this for years and years and, and, and work with thousands of people, there's always some nuance of it that you'd say, wow, I never thought of it that way before. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. And it kind of links back to what we were originally talking about, but it's almost, I don't want to say OCD sneaky, but in the sense that it's because of it, it's not a separate thing, but that part of the brain is, it's almost feels like to me, it's like it's just trying to survive. Like it will, it will try every which way to try and keep its kind of form. I know, and I, I know I'm talking, is, I know it's not a form, but like, yeah, I is I that making with, sense? Like, yeah, I think it's a tendency. We have a tendency to anthropomorphize illnesses yeah. and say, you know, it's like a person. And sometimes, especially with kids, that's useful to kind of give it a name mm -hmm. because it makes it more um, concrete in terms of what you're fighting. Yeah. But I think OCD is just like all our other physical, physiological processes and, and neurological processes. It's trying to do well by by us. Sometimes yeah. it's though just like an over, really, really overprotective parent. It, it, they're not trying to hurt you. They're trying to help you. They're just mm. crippling your life because they have a misguided idea about what safety means. Yeah. And I think OCD, I don't make it about it being evil or someone's possessed or trying to bully around. I, I think of it uh, that it's trying to help someone survive in a way that actually hurts them. Mm. Yeah, you yeah. Know? It wants to do well for you, but you know, sometimes buying a teenager a Porsche isn't a good idea. <laughs> it wants to keep yeah. you in the best of the best. But it's not good for you. I don't know if that was just a ridiculous example, but uh, no, but that's how I think about it. It's trying to do something with very, you know, OCD has really, really good intentions. It wants to make you pure, honest, correct, safe, but it mm. does so in just this ironic way that that actually brings on that which it fears. Just like many, I will analogize this to very overprotective parents. They want their kids to just be safe, but they become so safe they can't function sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, really, really good point. Thank you for that. Um, so, real broad question uh, around comorbidities, but I just, I just felt inspired to ask you this, which is, what does the world need to know about comorbidities and OCD? Well, it needs to know first of all that comorbidities are—it's um, much more the exception than the rule. Almost everybody. I've, I've mm -hmm. seen some, fi you know, different figures depending on where the research is, but you could say maybe as many as nine out of ten people who have OCD will have some other kind of condition or related issue at some point in their lives. So it's very prevalent. Uh, in fact, our protocol is when someone comes in for OCD treatment, we ask them about every condition that could possibly uh, correlate with OCD because it's easy to miss things. And people with OCD, as honest as they ca uh, will be, if you ask them directly, they may not offer the information. In other words, lies of omission rather than lies of commission are very much the norm in OCD. So we make sure to ask everything because I've had enough patients over the years that turn out to have a related condition and or, or you know, like skin picking or something. And I say, oh, did you discuss this in your former treatment? And they say, well, nobody asked me. And I'm sure I've, I've done the same, too, mm. because we try to think of everything, but it's hard to think of everything. But it's the first thing, I guess, is it's extraordinarily prevalent Two without treating, uh, you know, people are whole people and we don't want to turn them into lists of diagnoses. This is their whole system that, that they have OCD and they have all these related conditions. And if they're not addressed, they're, uh, six, you know, um, in an effective way, this is going to impede their progress tremendously. Yeah. So that's the second message. And I guess the third message would be that can be done. Most of the time, people who are experienced with OCD are also very experienced with the comorbidities and can somehow untangle them uh, and treat them in a way that there is kind of a, a cohesive way of addressing all of them because the truth is that a lot of the treatments for all of them are fairly similar, which is to have whatever your experience, learn how to keep going and be healthy and not be guided by a sad thought, an anxious thought, you know, a magical thought, you know, to actually make it, as we spoke about before, make those North Stars your values mm -hmm. and aim towards those no matter what. Easier said than done, of course. You know, um, I don't want to minimize how, how hard this is for some people because it just feels so bad, mm. but it can be done. Yeah. And some, sometimes people who have all these conditions, they do require extensive evaluation and intensive treatment. It can't be done just a little bit at a time because the complexities are, are so much. 
Yeah, no, no, thank you for that. And um, kind of brings me to my next question. And again, because we're kind of talking about comorbidities generally, um, it, it's such a broad subject and your, your answers would probably differ depending on which comorbidity. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, it, it could be depression addi- uh, or substance use disorder. It mm-hmm. could be... I'm trying to think of uh, general anxiety, social anxiety. Uh, that's alongside OCD. Which kind of do you tackle first or do you tackle them simultaneously? Well, I, I think it does go on a case-by-case basis. If someone is mm-hmm. so depressed that they they just can't really engage in OCD treatment, then the priority has to be a treatment of that depression. If they're using drugs to the extent that they can't engage and so on and so forth, or they're having a, you know, a manic episode or their thought disorder is so bad that it just might make OCD treatment uh, impossible. Mm. Uh, short of that, we tend to treat all of these conditions um, by having kind of a cohesive theory that that addresses them. While sometimes at the same that it addresses the whole ball of wax, so to speak. While at the same time segmenting out, you know, very specialized areas. For example, if someone with OCD also has an eating issue, we'll have them see uh, a nutritionist uh, in addition. Or if someone has a substance use problem, but it's not completely impairing their ability to work on OCD, they might be in a 12-step program. They might be in addiction counseling as well. Okay, cool. Okay, yeah. But it doesn't, assuming, yeah, that like you said, the comorbidity is kind of manageable at this time. It's not mm-hmm. a hindrance to, to work almost two of them together, say doing no, ERP. Uh, and, and, yeah. and you know what? We can think of them as kind of separate diagnoses, and that's how they would be listed if you were just doing a formal diagnosis. Yeah. But all of these things interrelate so much. So many people who have OCD are depressed, but it's hard not to be depressed if you have OCD. It's hard not to be frustrated. It's, it's hard not to be angry. Mm. You know, so, so addressing those things and um, in, in, in kind of the context of OCD treatment, and uh, just teaching people more about how to uh, live effectively on about the mechanics of, of one of the things we try to teach people about is the what anxiety is in an operational way or a very defined way that tells them, you know, this is what I need to do to be less anxious. So they have lots of tools or, or they, to, when, when you understand that frustration means you're blocked in a goal, it means you have to come up with a new goal. If you understand that a lot of anger is centered around having lots of rules for, about other people and about life. Changing and modifying those rules can really help. But all of these things, again, if OCD is the core of it, we do the exposures and we teach the tools so that that anger, depression, anxiety, whatever condition is there in a comorbid sense is not a barrier to improvement. Hmm. And if it becomes that way, then we might uh, partial, you know, partial out that, that thing to be treated until a person can really engage in OCD treatment. Yeah, no, no, thank you for that. that. That's great. And you you co-run the ranch with uh, Dr. Moritz. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we good just to, if anyone hasn't heard that episode, to kind of A, kind of go into what, what the ranch is, and then B, how you manage, because um, people in, in close proximity, how you're managing those the OCD and comorbidities together. Okay, so uh, to explain what NBI Ranch is, the, the concept was that many people who are in intensive treatment with OCD don't quite need to be in a hospital and need all the services that, that, that a hospital needs. Mm. And so we decided to provide something that's kind of in, in that, that area in between a hospital and, and outpatient treatment because just coming even very intensively outpatient isn't enough because when they're going home, they're undoing treatment or there's too many issues at home for them to make progress. So NBI Ranch really is a supportive living experience where people, people come from NBI Ranch and come to our nearby center every day for you know, day-long intensive treatment in most cases, and they return to the ranch at night where they practice their exposures, and they get, engage in, you know, a, in life activities, whether it's cooking, cleaning, getting along with other people or not, and working those things out, engaging, on, in, on, especially on the weekends and activities. We have uh, an equine therapy program that they, they attend, uh, that's in uh, association with us and all sorts of other activities uh, as well, because we want to be true to our philosophy that we want to bring. Um, that one of our statements is we want to bring treatment to life, mm. because it's not enough to get better in therapy in a therapy session. The NBI Ranch really affords people the opportunity to practice and generalize what they're doing all day in, 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 in therapy to a more real life environment 
as supported by our residential counselors who are there who are not doing active treatment, but just support, giving support and encouragement and monitoring uh, the implementation of what's been learned during the day in real time so they can feed it back to the clinicians for the next day's treatment. And how do we manage the people uh, there? Um, they're all, at NBI Ranch is for people over 18, so they're adults. So we might, um, you know, like any group of people together who have some maybe sometimes competing symptoms, you know, someone might like order, someone might like exactly where something is placed, or, I mean, you can go on mm -hmm. without even just have personality issues. We try to use everything that happens at NBI Ranch in that milieu as um, kind of a, 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 a living, like an ex example occurring in real time that we can understand just how to get along with other people, how to deal with things we don't like, how to, how to contribute, uh, and how to start living again. So many people with OCD just stop living. Mm. They stay in their rooms, they isolate, or they lead very marginal lives, or they're just kind of, just kind of trying to like almost float above life. They might, even if they're very highly functional and, and going to a job, they might in interact with with people too much. They just may do the, you know, have a marginal existence. Here at NBI Ranch, we really try to have people fully engage with life with all the with all the pluses and minuses that entails and build up their distress tolerance so that, well, you don't have to get along with everybody, but you do have to live and in, in, uh, live despite that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's great. And I, I love the model. Um, yeah, it all kind of links to uh, in inhibitory learning theory as well. As you said, getting them to do the exposures in multiple environments, not just in the, the st almost sterile yeah. and safe therapy room. Yeah, I would say an inhibitory learning model is one of our, our, our North Stars that we really try to vary exposures, use learning principles, do things that are kind of surprise. Uh, supr not, not that we do you know, spring exposures on people without their permission, but that there's a surprise value because again, that violates the expectancies most of all, that we have people do exposures that really are gonna model as closely as possible what they're gonna encounter when they go back to their regular lives. Yeah, yeah, really, really good point. Um, so one other comorbidity that I've never talked about on the podcast, which is um, autism spectrum disorder, which obviously is its very own thing in its own right. Um, mm -hmm. But in relation to OCD, I guess, how common is it kind of for the two to go hand in hand? Well, I would say that a lot of people with OCD, when you really look at their social uh, understandings, you could actually see a lot of ASD characteristics. Mm. Um, they may not be fully diagnosable, or they may be, you know, but you do see social comprehension issues, social functioning issues among people, among many people with, with OCD. Uh, vice versa is true as, as well. Among people at ASD, at whatever level of severity it is, there are there, um, a high proportion who have some sort of OCD-related condition. Now, those may be just OC, what we call OCD behaviors where there's not kind of a structure like they may tap something but it might not be for the magical reason of preventing something bad for happening and it may feel more natural to them to do it than your classic person with ocd who knows they're doing something irrational mm. but lots of people with asds who are, who are very you know otherwise very high functioning they may have more classic ocd symptoms so just to sum it up people with asd very commonly uh, have OCD symptoms. And the reason that's important is that they become a bottleneck for progress. Um, and, and, and unaddressed tend to grow. Uh, people with ASD more than people with OCD in general, as I said, they tend to identify with their thoughts, feelings, and sensations. That becomes them. And real life may matter less, like mm -hmm. having a job, having a relationship. They may not engage with that as much. So when working with someone with OCD, helping them develop their North Stars and, uh, is actually super important. It's one of the things that we're going to be discussing at um, the pre-con at the uh, OCD um, uh, conference this year, in fact, is, is how to help people with, with uh, ASD do something that sometimes people question that they can do to say, well, what kind of life do I want? Hmm. You know, and even if I don't see the value in OCD treatment or these, you know, what's so bad about me checking or watching the same thing over and over again, you know, these kind of quasi OCD kinds of, of, of behaviors. Well, they prevent me from having a job. They prevent me from having a relationship. They prevent me from functioning as an independent person in life. And many people with, those, with ASD seem to connect with that, much more than sometimes their families are surprised or spouses are surprised because they've never seemed to have um, connected with that before. But we try to make it very explicit. 
With ASD one of the, and OCD, one of the things we have to do is really modify our whole treatment protocol because all of life is filtered with OC, filtered through ASD, hmm. through the being differently minded. So of course we have to do the same thing with treatment because it's going to be understood differently. So we can't just go through the OCD manual with someone with, a, with ASD and really expect good results. We have to change it. Yeah. No, thank you for that. That, that was really interesting. Uh, it's something I should probably dedicate more of the podcast to at some point too. Um, okay, so general question now is what, what do you notice about your clients that seem to recover maybe a bit faster than some of the others? Well, the, one, the ones who do, do recover more quickly in general, they may have been higher functioning to begin with uh, than the, the ones who don't. They may have families who, where the structure really supports recovery. They may have been uh, earlier identified. A lot of the very young kids, even if they're very severe that, that we treat, they tend to do very, very well because they can't isolate themselves in their own apartment. They have to somehow deal with, with school, we hope, and, and with parents. Mm-hmm. So um, when, when there's a supportive family involved, when a person has a, a, a compelling reason to get better, when they... They haven't. Um, they they have kind of more of a understanding that they're that these are symptoms of an illness rather than just things that they're doing. Those are the people who tend to do better. But I will say that that regardless of almost anything else, if a person is willing to actually hold back and, and inhibit their responses to their thoughts or their responses to their fears, if they have that high level of willingness, then many things are possible. Mm-hmm. And. That seems to be, to me, uh, connected with uh, doing better, regardless of how you present for treatment. Yeah. No, that's that's interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I love asking that question. So, so the next one is just general sort of words of hope for people with OCD. Well, there there really is a lot of hope. I mean, OCD. When, when I when I started working with OCD, even though there were uh, some specialists around, um, generally people weren't that optimistic. Um, about people with OCD doing well. We've seen over the last few decades that, that many, many people with OCD can, can uh, resume very uh, typical lives with, with enough treatment um, and, and, and treatment that's really um, uh, directed at the heart of OCD, not just talking kind of around it, but, but people who are really engaged in exposures, which is still our, our ultimate gold standard uh, uh, tool in our toolbox. Um, people... Um, uh, actually, Katra and I always say, we've, since we've been doing this for so long, that, and we work with young kids as well as adults, that, um, that some of the kids that we worked with early in life, they're um, often amazingly resourceful and successful because almost anything that you can ask them to do is not as hard as uh, OCD treatment. And in fact, they're so, they're so aware and have so many, so many techniques and strategies to deal with adversity that they actually become uh, very resilient. You know, and I, I think there's, you know, the, the one is it, the, the message here really is is uh, extremely hopeful. Even if somebody's gone through treatment a lot and haven't had benefits, keep trying. It's just like like cigarettes. If you want to stop smoking, just keep trying. Lots of times people relapse, but there is a lot of evidence that if you try enough, eventually you figure out how to do it. So hang in there. This be my message. Yeah. Yeah, that that's a really good point. Uh, just the, the the matter of keeping trying, and also. Uh, learn from each time it doesn't work you know right dissect right. Most, it what didn't work what did work and yeah one of the things that very successful people often say is that they fail their way to success yeah. that they learn from failures and i think i think ocd treatment would be no exception mm-hmm. that is very difficult but it can be done yeah absolutely completely agree um okay so let's say you could pick up the phone and call your 20 year old self what would you tell him what would I tell my 20 year old self? I would, I would say the same message that I would say to any of my patients, hang in there. Mm-hmm. You know, life has all of its ups and downs, but the main thing is to be persistent. The, the main thing is to, to do really what I would model and, and, and talk about with uh, my patients and their families is that, that it's not so much what life is bringing, bringing to you. And I know I'm going to sound really corny, corny about, uh, uh, about this, but it's really what you bring to life that ultimately is going to be how you get content and happy and fulfilled in life. Because you never know, life is very, very unpredictable. But if you have strategies for dealing with it, you can make an extremely good life for yourself. 
Yeah, yeah, really good point. Um, so you got a billboard now in Florida. What do you want written on that billboard for everyone to see? Hmm. Well, I could paraphrase, paraphrase uh, Nike uh, and say, "Just don't do it." <laughs> regarding, regarding something like that, but I, I, I would actually uh, say that hanging in there is the hallmark of success. So whatever is whatever's happening to you, hang in there. And if it was directed at people with OCD, is not to let the OCD define you. That's just you know, that's just an aspect of your functioning. Functioning, we all have glitches. We can wear glasses. We can need braces. It's just another kind of glitch of, of and, and how, our, how we function. We're not perfect beings, but we can learn to live life in a very good way most of the time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love it. Okay, so is there anything else that I haven't asked you that you wish you could have shared today? Well, that would make me pretty OCD about our OCD podcast, right? Yeah. So I can tolerate incompleteness. Good. So I will just say it's really a pleasure, Stu, to uh, and a wonderful service that you're doing through the podcast. And it's, it's been so nice to meet you and, and, to, and have the opportunity to talk about what's been my passion for most of my adult life. Yeah. And uh, I hope to continue just having the privilege of working with people with, with OCD for as long as possible. No, thank you, and thank you for your time and uh, giving so generously of it, and uh, and obviously all the great work you're doing at MBI and the ranch. So uh, yeah, thank you. So there you have it. Really hope you enjoyed my chat with John, and all the show notes will be on the website at theocstories.com. And quick disclaimer, guys: this podcast is not therapy; it's not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.